Hello. In this high yield episode, I would like to provide a framework of understanding the differentiating features of uh, restrictive versus obstructive lung diseases. These are the top of our list of several categories of pulmonary disorders. Um, it's not necessarily a categorization exercise as much as a real clinical differentiating skill. The other categories such as vascular, neoplastic, pleural, respiratory failure types have their own very specific clinical symptomatology that will help differentiating them. So the very first question is in differentiating between obstructive versus restrictive lung diseases, what are the indices of pulmonary function tests that can come handy? So most of us know very well the FEV1 to FVC ratio. For example, we know that FEV1 to FVC ratio is decreased. That's less than 80% normal or expected for the patient or age. While in the restrictive lung diseases, FEV1 to FVC ratio is normal or even increased. So the question is, if we are not provided with the ratio, how we can distinguish these two scenarios, these two conditions from one another? Well, first and foremost, a very simple mathematics says if FEV1 to FVC ratio is decreased as in obstructive lung disease, the top value of the fraction, the numerator, uh, should be dropped or at least dropped out of proportion to the dropped FVC. And that's exactly what uh, other index that we need to know. And by that, I mean being able to independently analyze each one of them. Uh, put it simple, in obstructive lung diseases, FEV1 is necessarily decreased and conceptually it is completely logical because obstructive lung disease is due to variable intrathoracic obstruction if you remember from the pulmonary function test analysis and variable intrathoracic obstruction means normalization of the respiratory curve the flow volume curve during the forced inspiration but prolongation or obstructive pattern during the expiration and so that's what we say the expiration is prolonged therefore FEV1 ratio should be lower than expected now the tricky point is that how we analyze the FVC value in obstructive lung disease remember in obstructive lung disease FVC could also be low so that is one thing that many people may think FVC should be normal uh, no it is quite possible for the first vital capacity to be dropped or normal in obstructive lung disease. Why it is important? Because in restrictive lung disease, we definitely necessarily have reduced levels of FVC. And not only that, but FVC in restrictive lung diseases are decreased out of proportion to FEV1. And that is another tricky situation, okay? I'm asking you the differential diagnosis of decreased FEV1 without any other information provided. The differential diagnosis could be either obstructive lung disease or restrictive lung disease. Remember, decreased FEV1 is not a specific to obstructive lung disease. However, in obstructive lung disease, FEV1 is significantly reduced while FVC could be reduced or normal. On the other side, in the restrictive lung disease, both FVV1 and FVC are reduced. However, FVC, the denominator, excuse me, the denominator, the number in the bottom of the fraction, is decreased out of proportion to FEV1. And you know, if in a fraction the denominator is decreased more than the numerator, the total value of the fraction could increase. And that's why we say FEV1 to FVC is increased. Okay, so that's the analysis of FEV1 and FVC. How about a scenario in which they do not provide any of these three? They do not provide the ratio, they do not provide the individual value, <coughs> and they ask you to analyze if it is a restrictive or obstructive pattern. Uh, two important facts to bear in mind is, as you, I assume, know already, all restrictive lung diseases, especially the interstitial types, are associated with decreased 
long volumes. All long volumes and capacities are said to be decreased in the majority of the restrictive lung diseases. Okay, so I'm talking about functional residual capacity and total lung capacity. Specifically, these two are decreased on restrictive lung diseases. I'm not yet going to discuss residual volume. I would like to focus my attention on functional residual capacity and total lung capacity. These are decreased in restrictive lung disease in case they don't provide you any of the indices of FEV1 and FBC or their ratio. But these two, functional residual capacity and total lung capacity are increased. And it's logical because in obstructive lung disease, we have hyperinflation, we have air trapping, right? So please be able to analyze either in terms of FEV1 to FVC ratio or FEV1 itself being dropped out of proportion to FVC in obstructive or the FVC being dropped out of proportion to FEV1 in restrictive lung disease or the FRC and TLC being low in restrictive type and being high in obstructive type. After this is clear, to differentiate the subtypes of each one of these two major categories. However, we also may be asked questions about the shape of flow volume curves. As I mentioned, there is this uh, top of the line uh, portion of the curve, which usually belongs to the expiratory phase, and the bottom portion that belongs to the inspiratory phase. Expect some form of indentation or prolongation with um, increased kind of obliqueness of the top portion or expiratory phase that indicates dropped FEV1 in the obstructive lung disease. In restrictive lung disease, the values of the volume, pressure volume curve is just shifted towards the smaller numbers. Now, most of the pressure volume curves are numbered from zero to positive from right to left, which is a very unusual way, and that's because of the way dynamics of expiration and inspiration are measured on them. So usually they say the four volume loops are moved to the right and that indicates restrictive lung disease because the entire inspiratory expiratory phase functions in uh, the shorter or lower volume of the uh, curves. Now that said, we have three major categories of obstructive lung disease and four to five categories of restrictive lung diseases. There are sometimes some methods clinically and also based on pulmonary function tests to distinguish those restrictive lung diseases even though the best means of differentiation still is uh, biopsy. However, for the uh, restrictive lung disease and specifically for obstructive lung disease, we still can apply some rules from the pulmonary function test variables to be able to distinguish their major subtypes. So, what are the indices that can help us distinguish the major three subtypes of obstructive lung diseases. Remember two things. Measure diffusion capacity of lung for carbon monoxide plus response to short-acting beta dilators. These two tests are the best test to differentiate between asthma and COPD. And then if you are having patient with copious mucoperiolent sputum, underlying lung diseases, recurrent infections, clobbing, hemoptysis, that is bronchiectasis. So that's purely a clinical finding and usually we have an obstructive pulmonary function test plus these clinical scenarios that tells you you are dealing with bronchiectasis. That's easy. But the way we distinguish the asthma and COPD is based on the initial response to short-acting beta dilators. Now, simply if there is full reversibility by short-acting beta dilators of the clinical features and pulmonary function test indices, that is asthma. Now, what do we exactly mean the improvement of the pulmonary function test index by short-acting bronchodilators in asthma? If FEV1 increases more than 12%, at least 12 or more percents, or its equivalent in volume, which is 200 milliliters. 
that indicates asthma and the patient is usually asymptomatic between the episodes. On the other side, there is partial or no response to short-acting bronchodilators in, in case of COPD patients. Before moving forward, do you remember what is the test if the patient with uh, pretest probability of asthma has normal pulmonary function test? Well, if the patient has normal pulmonary function test, there's no use for beta agonist short-acting bronchodilators because the patient already has maximum uh, functionality in the pulmonary function test. And so we need to use the metacolin challenge test, the uh, cholinergic drug, to see if the patient's FEV1 drops. The value that's diagnostic for asthma in metacolin challenge test is a drop of FEV1 of at least 20%. So remember these for the diagnosis of asthma. Now, we are not yet done. We need to be able to differentiate two types of COPD. And I'm not talking about the clinical pictures. Yes, we are dealing with blue bloaters versus pink puffers. Those with all the clinical pictures, such as the ones who are overweight, could be bronch bronchitis or the thin ones, or COPD, the type of ABG, which indicates late hypercarbia in emphysema versus early hypercarbia in uh, bronchitis, or for example, the cough criteria of bronchitis, you know, more than three months per two consecutive years. But let's say these are not provided, but you are provided with some other indices from PFTs. What's that one test? That is diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide. Remember emphysema is damage or destruction of the alveolar wall. Like right so the diffusion capacity across the diffusion membrane which is alveolar wall should be decreased so we have low diffusion capacity for co dlco while in chronic bronchitis uh, that is normal also remember in the late stage of both subtypes of copd the dlco is reduced but usually in early uh, chronic bronchitis it's not reduced however in emphysema it's always universally reduced even though dlco is not the best test for diagnosis of asthma however if you are asked what you expect to see for the dlco values in asthma remember surprisingly you will see increased dlco and in my humble opinion that's because of the uh, hyperinflation that we have in asthma we have the increased surface area in the diffusion formula you remember what factors affect the gas exchange, the diffusion, surface area, diffusivity, and partial pressure, the pressure difference across the membrane are directly influencing it, while the thickness of the membrane uh, reduces the diffusivity. And that is why we have VQ mismatch in conditions associated with increased thickness, such as pulmonary edema, that the thickness of the alveolar membrane is increased. Okay. Likewise, the surface area is decreased in emphysema, and that's why we have it decreased. The diffusion is decreased and the mismatch could exist. And like I said, for a patient with obstructive pattern with these symptoms that you can see here, massive mucoperlin sputum, recurrent infection, hemoptysis, known risk factors, you are dealing with bronchiectasis. So let's turn our attention now on the features that can help us differentiate the subcategories of restrictive lung diseases. This is not much of a challenge as we had in the obstructive type and also it is not as well established, I would say, but we have at least two major subcategories of the restrictive lung diseases. What are they? Uh, they are either the conditions that are referred to as interstitial lung diseases, the ILD subcategory of restrictive lung disease, and then we have the conditions in which we are not dealing with interstitial lung disease, and there are the conditions in which there is either a musculoskeletal disorder, or chest wall disorder that limits lung expansion, or some form of neuromuscular junction disorder. This tells us that you may be provided with some chest wall deformities as a means to differentiate the ILD versus non-ILD subtypes of restrictive lung disease or some clinical pictures associated with certain musculoskeletal disorders including obesity, 
kyphosis, scoliosis, or some neuromuscular junction disorders, myasthenia gravis, you name it. However, clinical pictures aside, if you are only to rely on the variables of pulmonary function test. Remember the number one differentiating feature of interstitial subtype versus non-interstitial musculoskeletal chest wall subtype of restrictive lung disease is again the LCO, diffusion capacity of lung for the carbon monoxide. In the conditions that the indices and variables of the uh, diffusion formula, the surface area, thickness, uh, pressure gradient are not influenced, we will have normal diffusivity and therefore the normalized or normal value for the DLCO and that is the chest wall conditions. An obese patient does not have anything on the alveolar wall. A, a patient with myasthenia gravis who cannot expand his wall, chest wall easily does not have anything affecting the alveolar membrane as the point of origin of the pathology. So we are having normal uh, diffusion lung capacity for carbon monoxide. However, in the interstitial subtypes, as the name indicates, there is something in the interstitium, in the um, alveolar capillary membrane that affects the diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide, and that's the most important test. Um, sometimes in the non-interstitial type, it's possible that residual volume also be normal, okay? Now, that's why I told you that, yes, all the volumes are reduced in the restrictive lung diseases, but I also were careful to say in majority of them. So it is possible sometimes to have a restrictive lung disease with normal residual volume, and that is the non-interstitial subtype, those conditions due to chest wall deformities or uh, musculoskeletal neuromuscular junction disorders. These are the ones also with normal DLCO, but the ones with low DLCO uh, are the major subcategories of interstitial lung diseases, and uh, they also clearly have decreased residual volume and uh, functional residual capacity. Now, the very important question that's sometimes overlooked is what are the subcategories of interstitial lung diseases? which is itself a subcategory of restrictive lung disease, right? So put aside the myasthenia gravis, musculoskeletal disorders, chest wall disorders, obesity, kyphosis, scoliosis aside as a non-interstitial subtype, but what are the conditions? Well, yes, everyone knows pneumoconiosis and uh, environmental exposure, but we need to know there are several lung diseases that you may be given their pulmonary function test and you may find a restrictive lung disease pattern. So the first and foremost, I want to mention the vasculitis syndrome that affect the lungs. Again, it's the vessel, it's the capillaries possibility. So the alveolar capillary membrane for diffusion is involved. So we have low DLCO. So the vasculitis syndromes that affect the lung is one of them. Uh, the other, and again, I'm not going to go through the categories of interstitial lung disease right now. Just want to be clear about the ones that are usually overlooked. The other is sarcoidosis, which belongs to the category of granulomatous interstitial lung diseases. And the other category that is really, really important to know that it has restrictive pattern is the two major categories of pulmonary edema, the cardiogenic uh, pulmonary edema also known as congestive heart failure, and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, also known as ARDS. These two conditions are having the restrictive pattern pulmonary function test, and it is easy to remember because these two conditions are associated with buildup of fluid in the lungs and therefore decreased uh, compliance of the lung, and so that's logical to think the volumes are decreased and we have restriction and restrictive pattern spirometry. A case, you are given a case of patient with um, ulcerative lesions in both upper and lower respiratory tract, possible anchor positivity and some other systemic symptoms, possible renal abnormalities, and you are asked what you expect to see in the 
FEV1 to FVC ratio of this patient. Well, the case that I just described, and it's improvised, um, is a Wegener's granulomatosis. It's a vasculitis, and you know the vasculitis affect the alveolocapillary membrane. It, they pulmonary function tests belong to the restrictive pattern and therefore we have normal or increased FEV1 to FVC ratio. So please remember that. That said, we need to also be clear on the categories of interstitial lung diseases other than pneumoconiosis because that's what everyone knows. Uh, they have so many more, so many other categories also to consider. So pneumoconiosis itself are three asbestos related disorders um, and then berylosis, silicosis, uh, cold worker pneumoconiosis but also several other subtypes associated with environmental exposure other than exposure to silica, beryllium, asbestos or coal mine. The two other subtypes of environmental exposures causing interstitial lung disease are one two of the interstitial lung diseases associated with smoking the DIP and RB I will mention what they are and then we have the hypersensitivity pneumonitis which is related to several environmental exposure causing the respiratory pattern associated with a restrictive pulmonary function test now you may be asked question about a patient who has restrictive pulmonary function test uh, upon uh, an, uh, smoke exposure or is a smoker and specifically the pathology reports one thing and that's macrophage accumulation this is one of the two types of smoking related interstitial lung disease which is called discrimative interstitial pneumonia versus respiratory bronchiolitis in our dedicated episode to interstitial lung diseases we will discuss the means to differentiate them so that takes care of the environmental exposures. Then you may be provided a restrictive spirometry and you may be also given that the patient has granuloma in the pathology. Um, the patient has Disney on exertion and some other findings. So what are the differential diagnoses of interstitial lung disease that are associated with possibility of granuloma? Be very careful, not only sarcoidosis, but even some of the pneumoconiosis, such as specifically berylosis and silicosis, could form granuloma. The other very important differential for the granulomatous interstitial lung disease, and you have a patient that does not fit the differentials for uh, sarcoidosis or the pneumoconiosis, is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. A very tricky condition because it's a hypersensitivity reaction. The patient has some respiratory symptoms after exposure, especially seasonal exposure, that may trigger you to think it is some sort of asthma condition. However, surprise, surprise, you see the restrictive pattern in pulmonary function test. That is definition of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. We will discuss it. It's a, one of the high yield interstitial lung diseases. We will discuss it in a dedicated episode. And then we have the final category of secondary ILDs, secondary type interstitial lung diseases, and those are the interstitial lung diseases in association with some connective tissue diseases. Um, the most famous example is perhaps the Kaplan syndrome of rheumatoid arthritis, but also if you are given a, a case of SLE patient with Disney on exertion and uh, some other findings in the chest x-ray etc and you are asked what you expect to see in the pulmonary function test uh, remember pick one of the choices that favors a restrictive pattern um, in the case of systemic sclerosis you need to differentiate primary versus secondary hypertension secondary pulmonary hypertension and we will discuss that in details in our discussion of uh, pulmonary hypertension and other high yield episodes okay we are done with the secondary causes or secondary subtypes and environmental exposure subtypes of which is one of the categories of secondary types of the interstitial lung disease. We have two more categories to go and one is the four idiopathic types and then at the end we have the pulmonary eosinophilia syndromes or 
any condition in association with pulmonary eosinophilia. So let's start with those ones. What are these conditions? Uh, many drugs can induce restrictive lung disease and eosinophilia. What we need to be careful here is not all drug associated ILDs are necessarily associated with eosinophilia. Uh, we will discuss them again in a dedicated episode with some other ILDs, but can give examples of these drugs. Busulfan, bleomycin, amiodarone are, are the female examples. Uh, amiodarone, nitrofurantoin, etc. Okay, what other restrictive lung diseases are associated with eosinophilia? Well, we have simply eosinophilic pneumonia. We could have helminth infestations with their famous eosinophilia. Uh, they can, uh, the, the larva migration or whatever lung affected by the helminth life cycle could be associated with respiratory symptoms, plus eosinophilia. Remember, if you are asked about the possible pattern of pulmonary function test in those scenarios, pick something that favors restrictive pattern. The other is this allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis with similar asthma symptoms. Uh, we have Chergistros, the eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Again, similar to the case of Wegener I provided, if you are provided case that have these kind of symptoms and you are asked what's the possible uh, FEV1 to FVC ratio, pick the restrictive lung pattern. And then we have the uh, specific hyper eosinophilic syndromes, some of the tropical hyper eosinophilic syndromes, Loeffler syndrome, we'll discuss them later. Just want you to know that if you have some sort of pulmonary disorder with eosinophilia, if you are asked what is the possible pulmonary function test um, other than the asthma, other than the conditions that shout out at you that it is asthma, um, because asthma could also in one of its subtypes be associated with eosinophilia, uh, pick the restrictive pattern. But they need to provide you more uh, details, more uh, clinical pictures and information to help you uh, distinguish between them. The final group in this ILDs section are the idiopathic interstitial lung diseases. The ones that are not associated with eosinophilia, the, necessarily the ones that are not associated with connective tissue diseases or environmental exposure or granuloma formation, but uh, they are well-known idiopathic causes. We have very important differentials here. One is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, the prototype example of interstitial lung diseases. Uh, what's the other name of it, by the way? The IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is also called usual interstitial pneumonia. Now, the most important differential of the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is the second subtype of interstitial pneumonia, and that is so-called non specific interstitial pneumonia. I'm going to repeat this in their dedicated episode, but because it's honestly a bit cruel, it's worth repeating the way to differentiate them. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis usually has subpleural opacities in the lower lung fields and is not very responsive to corticosteroid therapy and has worse prognosis, while non-specific interstitial pneumonia, the other type of interstitial pneumonia, not the usual interstitial pneumonia, but the non-specific interstitial pneumonia, is the one that is responsive to corticosteroids and therefore has a better prognosis. And the uh, imaging is a general grand glass appearance, not the opacities in the lower lung fields. So that's how we differentiate these two interstitial pneumonia syndromes with the restrictive pulmonary function test pattern. That takes care of two of our four idiopathic ILDs. The other two are cryptogenic organizing pneumonia and acute interstitial pneumonia. Now, just remember two things. We will discuss them in more details later in their episode, but the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia is also called bronch bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia. And so the patient has symptoms associated with small airway involvement and acute interstitial pneumonia is the only type of interstitial lung disease with acute presentation. So if you have a case with acute respiratory symptoms and the pulmonary function test is showing restrictive pattern, 
and you see a lot of these conditions we talked, and also you see AIP, pick the AIP, not acute intermittent porphyria, but acute interstitial pneumonia. Okay, I hope I haven't made you angry about this. The take home message is one and one thing, be able to analyze the pulmonary function test values beyond FEV1 to FVC and always apply DLCO to differentiate the subtypes of both obstructive and restrictive lung diseases. In the non-interstitial type restrictive lung disease, we have normal DLCO, but the residual volume is reduced. But in the mm, musculoskeletal or chest wall subtypes, DLCO is normal. It's possible for residual volume to be normal. In the obstructive pattern, the FRC and TLC total line capacity are increased contrary to restrictive pattern, but the first test is degree of reversibility with short acting bronchodilators. If it's full reversibility, it's asthma. If not, we use DLCO to differentiate between chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Also, don't confuse chronic bronchitis with bronchitis, which is an infectious syndrome of the lungs. Okay, uh, this finishes this introductory episode, which I believe is very high yield for differentiating several obstructive and restrictive lung diseases.